Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ally PLM Solutions Overview of Solid Edge with Synchronous Technology, the Future of CAD. Um, I'm Amy Phipps with Ally PLM Solutions. Um, I'm in the sales department, and Brandon Carden is our application engineer, and he'll be presenting the demonstration this morning. Um, just the agenda for today's overview, it's going to run about an hour. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of overview of Ally PLM as well as the history of design tools and the future of 3D design with Solid Edge. And then Brandon will go into some demonstration and we'll follow up at the end with questions. So I'm going to have you guys muted through the main presentation just so that we don't have a lot of feedback um, um, in the audio. And then we'll open it up for question and answers at the end. So a little overview of Ally PLM Solutions. Uh, we are Siemens uh, solution partner and we provide solutions for Solid Edge in the NX product family. Uh, CAM Express, CMAP, and Team Center. We provide training for the, the Solid Edge mentoring, consulting services, as well as their technical support. And just an overview of Siemens uh, software solutions. Um, we have a product lifecycle management solution that kind of takes you all the way from conception of a product all the way to obsolescence of a product. And that uh, life cycle is from the CAD with NX and Solid Edge through a validation with FEMAP, um, as well as team center to management and the manufacturing is, is with um, NX or CAM Express. All right, Amy. Just, yeah, Brandon, why don't you take over with a little yeah. bit of the history of CAD. I'll take over. First of all, um, once again, my name is Brandon Carter. I'm an application engineer here with Ally PLM Solutions. Um, uh, what we want to look at today is, is kind of a high a uh, high-level approach of, of introduction to Solid Edge, uh, and this particular release is, sol release is Solid Edge with Synchronous Technology 3. So what we want to do is we want to talk about synchronous technology and, and kind of make you aware of what synchronous technology is and how it, how it works inside of Solid Edge. Plus, we, like I said, we want to give you a, a high-end uh, overview of, of all the environments inside of Solid Edge. So to kind of get us started, let's kind of look at how CAD has evolved and kind of tell a little bit of a, a story here. Uh, you kind of see the slide we have up. Geometric modeling started, you know, probably in the 70s. A lot of 2D, obviously, at first. Some primitive, primitive 3D at the turn of, you know, 1980. Um, I've heard stories of, you know, you walk into a room, the computer is a bit half as big as a room. You know, I'm talking several hundred thousand dollars, and somebody might put a block up on the screen, and everybody's excited. But I'm I'm probably not quite old enough to remember that, so that's why I say I've heard stories. <laughs> um, in the the 80s, we got some more solid-based modeling, but when things totally changed was which feature-based modeling in the late 80s with ProE. ProE come along and and um, introduced parametrics, so some repetitive tasks were automated. You know, we had some, some dimensions, some shell algorithms, and so forth, and it made modeling easier, but it's still difficult, and then there's, it's still time consuming to build and rebuild, rebuild that history tree and so forth. So that was in the late 80s when ProE introduced that. In the mid-90s, um, those parametrics uh, still apply, and companies like Solid Edge and SolidWorks came along and put it on the Windows platform, made it easier to use. And, and made it more affordable, uh, uh, mostly there. But it did make it easier to use, but it's still based on the same parametric technology as far as having a, a what we call a linear history tree. And, and as we go through the demonstration today, I'm gonna try to point out what, what I mean by a linear history tree for those of you that may not be familiar and, um, and what we're doing inside of Synchronous. So up to 2000, you know, that, that's the technology we've been using. So that's where Synchronous technology comes into play. So what we're talking about with the parametric technology, the old technology, if you will, is the history-based modeling on the left. So it's going to re require pre-planning, you know, things like, do I fully constrain this sketch? Is this round feature going to come before the cutout or after the cutout? You know, and, and is this thin wall or the thinning application or the thinning feature going to come before this cutout, after that cutout, before this hole? and so forth. For those of you that may be familiar with those history-based modeling, you know the order and the parent-child relationships of that history tree are very, very important. So that does require a lot of pre-planning. Because of that parent-child relationship, you see that it can be inflexible when outside changes or when drastic changes to the model are made. Not all those features are able to recompute, therefore we have to go in and manually do that. But the good things about history 
based modeling, as we kind of already mentioned, are dimension driven, highly automated, and feature based. <clears throat> On the right side, you, you see what explicit modeling is. And explicit modeling are, are some, some newer technologies, kind of this, you know, I'm going to directly interact with the model. Uh, they're featureless, uh, but they're very flexible. They have weak driven dimensions, which is kind of bad for us engineers who say this line needs or this face needs to be two inches or whatever the case may be. But it's very easy to use because you have direct interaction with the model. So if you look in the center, synchronous technology is kind of the best of both worlds. It's taking the parametrics and the feature-based uh, modeling from the history, history-based modeling, and it's taking the flex fast, flexible edits and the easy to use because you have direct interaction with the model from explicit modeling and you have synchronous technologies. Synchronous technology, sorry about that. So it's doing a synchronized solve and you're going to see this dynamic edit when we get into the demonstration and we're going to look at how live rules and driving 3D dimensions maintain your design intent inside of synchronous technology. So that's just kind of giving you some things to look at. Also to give you um, some things to think about, I want you to think about these questions throughout today. Excuse me, I had to get a drink already. If, if, for those of you that do have a 3D system, think about, are you really creating in 3D? So what we mean by sketch and sweep is that traditional, that history-based system I just mentioned on the previous slide. I draw a profile out in a plane, and then I sweep that in 3D space. So we call that sketch and sweep. So if a sketch and sweep system is really 3D, why do we spend so much time in the 2D sketch, constraining it, placing all our dimensions there, why do we spend all the time in the 2D to get that 3D model? Also, while you're thinking about it, for those of you that have 3D systems, if I'm going to make a change to a particular feature in a traditional CAD system or a sketch and sweep system, why do I always have to go back to the sketch and make a change to that sketch, that sketch dimension, that constraint, whatever the case may be, why can't I just do that straight to the model? Also, are we really capturing our design intent in 3D? Well, in a sketch and sweep system, why do we have to go back and whenever we're creating that sketch, why do we have to add the intelligence to the sketch? So for example, if you look up in the upper right hand corner of the slide, you see that <clears throat> the right side of the legs of the E, you see that there's constraints. You see a little plus sign um, uh, in between each of those lines. So that's showing that all those need to maintain in a line. Why do we have to keep going to that sketch and why do we have to capture all of our design into, in the sketch? And wouldn't it be nice down in the bottom right to just be able to pick one of those faces of those legs or place a 3D dimension on there and, and saw, or have something know the design intent and that's what you're going to see with synchronous technology. So kind of keep that in mind. Also, for those of you that maybe have migrated from 2D to 3D or thinking about, maybe you have 2D AutoCAD and you're thinking about migrating to 3D, if that's the case, why in a sketch and sweep system do we still have to open the 2D drawings that have a 2D sketch and have everything done in the 2D as we make that model? Whereas what you're going to see with synchronous technology, we can have those dimensions straight on the 3D model as you see in the bottom right. So those are just some questions to think about as we go throughout uh, today's demonstration and, and some things to look at with synchronous technology. So let's go ahead and, and get into the software. Um, all right, so what you're looking at here is something that most people I would think are somewhat familiar with is a lawnmower. This is actually a, uh, the Dixie Chopper from... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Dixie Chopper Lawnmower, which is a, a solid edge customer. And you're looking at an assembly of, I believe, about 2,000 parts. Now, I'm rotating this around on the screen, and you're probably seeing it a little choppy because of the internet. Bear with me. Uh, I'm gonna, I have a little audience view thing up here. If I see it, uh, me getting too far ahead, I will slow down and let the, the internet catch up with us. So right now I'm rotating that around. Um, we want to look at modeling some components here in a second, but as far as being able to turn on and off components with something we call display configurations, I can quickly do that hide and show type operation. And the other thing, some nice visual visualization tools, something like dynamic clipping planes, where I can come through and do a dynamic section through the model. And you'll see as I drag through here, this is going to dynamically section through the model. Let me do this uh, so you can see this over the web. 
but you see that's nice that I can go in there and create my section, maybe work inside of certain planes, or I can definitely see the internal components of this assembly. Some nice tools there. Let's go ahead and, and, and start looking at modeling some components and introduce you to synchronous technology. Um, what we're going to do is, is model in a top-down approach, and what I mean by that is we're going to edit and create and make changes to a part in the context of the assembly. So you see that I'm editing this part, and you see the background components. And what we're going to make is we're going to make kind of this, this casted bracket, if you will, that holds these transaxles together. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you see some mounting, mounting places on the transaxles, and we're going to create a bracket that goes over top of that pulley, and and um, and mounts to that those transactions. The first thing I want to point out, and with Solid Edge, is this radio button. I'm just holding my right mouse button down, and this can be 16 of my favorite or most used commands right at my right at my fingertips in each environment. So right now I'm modeling a part. Uh, later you'll see me do some drawings in the draft environment, and then some sheet metal and so forth. But these are 16 of my favorite commands. These can be customized and I can use these. And you're going to see me, actually, what I could do, you see all the solid edge tools up here. I could minimize those tools to give me more screen real estate, and I can work right off of my radio button. OK, so let's, so I'm going to try, sometimes uh, whenever I'm doing a presentation over the web using the radio button, you don't even see it come up uh, because of the lag, but I'll, I'll try to slow some of that down so you can see because of the internet. But what I want to do is create some construction geometry. And you'll see that, that I get my, my feedback as opposed to where I want to sketch uh, for my construction geometry. And I'm just going to create a, a rough uh, rectangle there and throw some dimensions on there. I'm using my radio button, once again, to get those dimensions. Uh, maybe I want to create a couple other uh, lines for construction geometry. <coughs> and we'll go ahead and, and throw some dimensions on those guys, too, just to kind of locate those. Now you notice I haven't located the width of this. Maybe I don't know right now what the width is. Maybe I know that it does need to mate up to that frame, but I'm not concerned about that right now. So what I can do is, with synchronous technology, I can just select those and we have a region concept. So notice how, how that entire construction geometry is highlighted. And then I can say I want to add material. So just by clicking a little extrude handle, Solid Edge knows that's your first feature. Whatever you have selected, we're going to add material. Also, you notice the other two regions, I can select those multiple regions at the same time, and I can pull those legs off towards us a certain value. Well, let me go ahead and talk about a couple things that we've, we kind of saw on the slides. I'm going to turn off the background components that are using my radio button. What you're going to see is, is just the part. I've just turned off the background components. So whenever we were looking at that E shape that we saw on the slide, both of those faces that you see in front of those legs were extruded at the same time. So, you know, why wouldn't the system know that, hey, those faces need to be maintained a coplanar condition? So what we have down here below is something called live rules. So if I want to make a change, notice how I'm directly interacting with the 3D model. I've selected that face. I didn't go back to a sketch. I've picked that face. And notice how the face on the right has also come along for the right because, one, it realizes that that part is symmetric. So the design intent is there at the 3D model, and I'm directly interacting with those faces. I could also use one of these 3D drive dimensions. This dimension does exist on the 3D model. It has nothing to do with a sketch, and I can increase or change that dimension. Notice how the right leg is also moving as well because of live rules. Once again, it's picking up that that is uh, symmetric. And you're going to see uh, more examples of that as we go along. Let's go ahead and continue making uh, some shape as you probably saw we needed that to go over top of the um, the belts and the, the, the pulleys there. So we need to create some material over top. What I'm doing here is just giving myself some construction geometry. Notice how I'm just sketching in the three in the three D so to speak. And maybe we want to go ahead and create a um, a place for those for this amount to the transaction I should say. I, I showed you the holes earlier. Let me go ahead and sketch that. So here I'm just using my radio button, and I just went into the circle command. Like I said, my tools are right at my, my fingertips. And maybe I want to use that construction geometry to the other side. I'll just mirror it to the other side and maintain my, my symmetry concept. So once again, as you kind of already saw, we have this region concept where I can select a region, and based on what, hitting that extrude handle, 
In this case, there's not material there, so as I bring my cursor up, it knows to add material. If I bring my cursor down into the model, it knows to cut it away. So right inside of the same command, that same region concept is whether I'm pushing or pulling, it knows whether it's going to add material or remove material. In this case, I want to add some material above it. If I go ahead and rotate this guy around, I want to create the, the mounting ears for that for the transaxle. So I'm just going to select those regions and notice how once again I can just add that material. It's very, very quick and easy just to pick and push those regions. We need this to fit over top of those pulleys, so I'm going to rotate this guy over a little bit on the side. I'm going to create a little bit of some construction geometry here where that <clears throat> I want this to kind of come up to the inside. And once again, I probably want to mirror that and use that on the other side. So once again, the region concept, if there's not material there, it knows to add it. If I push my cursor up into the model and there's already material there, it knows to cut it. Now you notice right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not pre-planning, I'm just kind of getting my rough shape. And what I want to do is use synchronous technology plus the background components of my assembly to get this to fit. The other thing you're going to notice, maybe you are coming from a, new, uh, a different CAD system. And down here on the bottom right, there's a tool called Command Finder. So maybe I'm a 2D user and I'm familiar with a tool called Fillet. What I want to do is round those edges. So I'm going to type in Fillet in the Command Finder. And you're going to see Command Finder come up. And also, notice how whenever I scroll across each of those, one, this is a great learning tool to be able to match and say, hey, what is this called in Solid Edge? Two, it also shows you where the tool is located. So notice how it's went ahead and put my, my toolbar back out, and it's showing me that, hey, I'm looking for a round command. That's an operation I do in the 3D. So I'm going to go ahead and use that round command. And I'm just going to round some edges here just to give it, give it a little more shape. And we'll make those 50 millimeters. I'm going to come in and round the inside edges and make those half as big. <coughs> now, we talked about on one of the slides, is, is your system really 3D? If so, why do you have to add all your design intent and all your, your constraints, so to speak, inside the sketch? Here with synchronous technology, you see that I can pick this, the face in the 3D, and if I want to make that concentric or coaxial with that arc, Notice how it's moving everything down. It's moving everything down because of symmetry, but I've built that intelligence in there right in the 3D. I didn't go back to a sketch. Here, maybe I want to also relate this face, and that's the tool that I'm using. It's called the Relate Tool, and I want to relate it to this, this face, and now that those are always going to be parallel. So notice how I'm maintaining that design intent at the 3D model. Here's the steering wheel. You probably see me use it a little bit already. And what this allows me to do is move and rotate faces with grab and go tools. So you're probably going to hear me say grab and go tools a lot. I apologize for that. You can yell at me at the end because you said grab and go too much. But if I want to rotate those faces, notice how live rules is going to maintain the tangency and also the intelligence that I build in saying that those faces have to remain parallel. So I can just quickly rotate those faces. What if I want to come up and this opening needs to be a little larger because of how it's going to fit across those pulleys? Notice how I can select that axis and it's moving both sides because of symmetry. Also, if I need to tweak the height of it, notice how it maintains those rounds because it's picking up that those are, are tangent. The other thing, if I rotate this guy around, we looked at those, I just kind of, I didn't pre-plan the exact location of these mounting ears, but you'll see that if I select one of those holes, and as I move those around, right now I have symmetry on, so it's moving just because of those holes. It's picking up all the faces that are adjacent because of uh, tangencies and, and also uh, uh, the concentric, right? The hole is concentric to the arced, uh, the, the arced face there. What I can do is if I hit S on my keyboard, I can turn off symmetry and notice how it's just moving one. So that shows me that I, I'm not using symmetry now. And also down in the bottom in live rules, the live rule for symmetry is highlighted in red, which shows me that the system knows there's symmetry, but I have turned it off. So the red is showing me that you're ignoring symmetry, which is fine, but I just want you to know that you are ignoring it. If I turn back on symmetry, now one tool I really like to use is actually pause the move. So right now I've just paused the move, and if I turn back on the background components, I'm going to hit V on the keyboard to unpause, and notice how I can reference the background components, and maybe I want to select that edge and notice how I've lined up those holes just by clicking that and moving it and clicking it and referencing those transactions. So I didn't pre-plan the location of those. I got my shape of my part 
now using synchronous technology, I can reference and, and make those or you know make those line up by uh, doing the move. The next thing, whenever I, I, I first created this, you notice it's not quite wide enough. It doesn't go up to the frame. But that's very easy to do if I just want to fence stretch or window select around the faces I want to move. I can then take my steering wheel and say, move those out to the frame. And notice how I've moved the other side once again because of symmetry. Now let's take a look at uh, the 3D dimensions again. I'm going to go ahead and turn back on my 3D dimensions, some of the ones that, that's been created so far. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to add a dimension. And notice how I'm adding a dimension straight to the model. I'm not adding it to a sketch. So right now you see the length there, 120. And what I want you to do is notice how we have different options for how that's going to calculate. So for example, I've, I've had this 60 millimeter dimension on the left. If I want to drive that down, Notice how right now that, that horizontal dimension that I placed just placed is now down to 115. It keeps getting smaller. So that face to the inside is maintaining its angle. Right? So you see how it's maintaining its angle. If I go back to 60 where we're at, I'm going to select that again, and I come up and do a tip option. Notice how now as I increase that, notice how that 120, in this case 120.2, is maintaining as I increase that. So the point is I have a lot of flexible options for how the 3D model is going to calculate. And if I want to make that 80, I can type in 80. We're engineers, we need exact values. We're going to come back to a few more of, of, of that, I'm sorry, a few more examples of that just in a second. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the background components so we can look at this again. And right now you see that there's some mounting holes in the frame that I need to uh, project across to my, my model. Now why, why draw those and locate those from scratch whenever I have the geometry using the top-down design, I can just go ahead and include or project those. And notice how I'm just borrowing the geometry from the frame onto my part. And with synchronous technology, I can window select those regions. And once again, if I try to move it where there's not material, it's going to try to add it. If I want to move it back towards my model, it's going to go ahead and remove it. It knows that inside of synchronous. So I'm going to say cut that through all. And notice how we have those cutouts. So let me go ahead and turn off the background components so you can see that a little better. Now right now, the way I just cut those through, once again, I didn't pre-plan where the location of this center structure is going to be. Right now, that's kind of ugly. This cutout two is cutting in the back face, and I do not want that to happen. With synchronous technology inside of Solid Edge, I can detach that. And if I look at more of a front view, we kind of looked at window selecting a minute ago. I can window select the parts of my model that I need to move, and then I can just select and say, move this over, you know, maybe 15 millimeters. And you see how I've moved that. And now I can come back and say, you know what, let's go ahead and attach that back. Say I want to include that in the model, and you see how quick and easy that was to clean up kind of uh, my mistake or me not paying attention or whatever the case may be. Let's go ahead and finish off this model with a couple rounds. Maybe I want to round these, these edges up here. And as far as making some changes, maybe make this, give it a little bit more room up in the front. Um, <coughs> excuse me, what I want to do is actually rotate these faces. So you see that it's very easy to, to move my steering wheel. And as I rotate those faces, notice how the faces closest to us are moving as well because of symmetry. And maybe I want to rotate those 20 degrees. I can also just move those faces back. And notice how I'm just quickly manipulating the steering wheel with that select set. So you see very, very quickly, very quick and easy, I can go ahead and make changes uh, to the model. And my live rules are maintaining my design intent. If I, if I turn back on the PMI dimensions, let's think about this for a moment. Everybody creates 2D drawings, right? Everybody creates 2D drawings. Some people work in 2D. That's all they have. But let's take a look at, at what, we're, what we've been doing with these dimensions. These are PMI dimensions. It stands for Project Manufacturing Information. And really what PMI was created to do is try to get away from creating all these drawings. You know, a lot of engineers, a lot of drafters spend a lot of time creating drawings of these models. And, you know, there's more and more CAM software, uh, the manufacturing software to you know, just need a model. And, and maybe we want to pull out a, a, or show a couple of critical dimensions here. So, you know, I have my PMI dimensions. Obviously, with what you've seen so far, you've seen that these PMI dimensions also drive the geometry. So you see there's a, a very a very nice link between manufacturing information and what we're actually using 
to, to move and, and edit these models. So if I look at a top view, I'm just rotating the model over. Here's some manufacturing dimensions we've already placed. I can go ahead and dimension my model. In this case, maybe I want this to be 20 millimeters. We've seen us make those changes. But also, I can kind of go ahead and detail and use these as, like I said, details for my model. And I'm going to show you how to create drawings a little bit later, but also I'm going to show you how to retrieve these on the drawing sheet. So look for that a little bit later. Also here I'm just doing dimensions, but also with PMI I can come in here and maybe I want to go ahead and put some weld symbols on my model. You know, maybe I need to reinforce that with a weld. Maybe I want to go ahead and put some datums on my, my model. And I'm just using the PMI. Maybe I want to put a feature control frame for GD&T. You know, this is going to be perpendicular to a datum within a certain value. So you notice that I'm kind of doing a lot of details right here on my model. And obviously that's beneficial because if somebody has a 3D model, they can rotate that around. But I'm also gathering this, this manufacturing information. So just kind of keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that information here in a little bit. So there I've, I've turned back on my background components and we went back to the top level. And notice how I didn't have to pre-plan, I just got some construction geometry out there. And by using synchronous technology, I was able to stretch and fit that into the location that it needs to be and how it's mounted and so forth. The next thing we want to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, move on to is, is let's take a look at sheet metal. And I don't know how many of you use sheet metal, but I want to, like I said, give you a um, an overview of, of the environments inside of Solid Edge. And here I've just, like I said, I did another display configuration where I can quickly turn on and off components. And what we're going to end up modeling here is a sheet metal cover for this particular pulley on, on this side. So this pulley and this belt uh, where my cursor is. I don't know if you can see that across the web. You'll, you'll see where it's going here in a minute. So once again, I'm going to use my radio button. <coughs> and what I want to do is, is invoke the... Uh, the uh, the rectangle command. So once again, 16 of my favorite commands right at my cursor location per environment. They can they can be fully customized. And what I'm going to do is just create a rectangle to start my shape, give me some construction geometry. And once again, that creates the region. But now we're in sheet metal. So notice as I extrude that region, notice how it's giving me a gauge material thickness. And where that's coming from, let me go ahead and create that, is from our material table. If I go up here to Properties, Material Table, <coughs> we have a Material tab, which I have in both part and sheet metal environment. I have a, a long list of materials. This can be fully customized, steel, aluminum, etc. But because I'm in sheet metal, I also have a Gauge tab. So I can have a library of gauges, different thicknesses. In this case, I'm using excuse me, 14 gauge, which has the material thickness, the default bend radius, the reliefs, and also how that's going to create a flat pattern, which we'll look at in a little bit. So that's where it's, it's grabbing the uh, material thickness from. With synchronous technology, I can just grab those material thickness faces there, and just by clicking a, a button on my, my steering wheel, so to speak, I can go ahead and drag off flanges. It's very, very quick and easy. If I rotate this around, I talked about being able to pre-plan, but let's let's kind of ignore where this is at. I've turned off the background assembly. Let's ignore that this is going to cap over top of this pulley. Let's just think about this as a sheet metal part that, that we started from scratch. And let's think about the design intent or pre-plan. And if I come in here and I place these 3D driving dimensions, maybe I place one on the top there and one on the inside. So you notice the difference between my dimensions. One, this 190 dimension is dimension to the outside faces, and this 186.04 is dimension to the inside faces. So I've created my basic shape, and whether this is going to fit inside of something, the critical dimension is the outside, it's going to fit inside of something, I can click on that 190 and make that change. Maybe I need to make that larger. Or maybe this is going to cap over top of something. Now I can click that bottom dimension, and maybe that's my critical dimension, and I can make that, in this case, 175, kind of shrink that down. The point is, I have my basic part, and depending on where I place my PMI dimensions, I, I, don't have, I didn't have to pre-plan whether this is going to fit inside, outside, as I started the base feature. I can go ahead and place my 3D die driving dimensions and be able to, to tweak that uh, based on what I need there. I'm going to create a line. 
and notice that <clears throat> I just step back and I just create a construction line out there. And I'm going to show you how to tweak that in a minute. And I'm going to go and use a jog command, a sheet metal specific jog command. And what that's going to do, you'll see dynamically here, I'm just going to create a, a step kind of a jog off on that sheet metal face. So maybe I want that to be out 30 millimeters. Now I didn't pre-plan where that line was, but notice that here with the 3D I can use my steering wheel and I can locate that face wherever I want even after the fact. So like I said, I didn't have to pre-plan where that line was going to be located. I could create it or tweak it in the 3D. Now if we want to rotate that face, if we get a little more of the, the shape we want, we go ahead and turn off that particular live rule. And notice I can let's again rotate that out 38 degrees. If I come up here, I can also rotate this, this face out, and I'm just docking my steering wheel. You see the steering wheel is going to be the center of rotation, and maybe I want to rotate that out something around 27 degrees. If, if you do any sheet metal, think about how many different cuts it would take to get a shape like this. Here I'm just, I have my rough shape, and I'm just going to rotate those particular faces. So let me come back over here. Let's rotate this back 52 degrees, and notice how I even rotated back that thickness chain. And like I said, if you do any sheet metal, think about how many cutouts and how many unbend and rebend commands it would take take to do that. I want to close this off. I'm going to create another flange. I'm just going to create another flange normal by default. But maybe I don't know what the angle difference is between this face, which I have highlighted on the screen. I'll wait till that updates on your internet there. That face and then this large face here. I want those to be coplanar. With synchronous technology, because I'm doing everything in 3D, I can go ahead and relate and go ahead and say make that coincident to that face. Then I can come in here and if I want to close that up, I can go ahead and manipulate my steering wheel so that it gives me a two millimeter gap between those. And notice how I've, I've just quickly closed up that particular uh, hole with a flange. A couple other things here. If I want to create a couple of mounting flanges, I'm going to go ahead and pull that off. Notice how I can reference the background assembly. Now you see how that's starting to come together. Maybe, I, maybe my design intent, I want to maintain this, this flange length to be 40, and I want to lock that down. So right now, that's going to maintain 40, and what that's going to do for me as I rotate this face with my synchronous tools, in this case, I want coplanar to be on, and notice how I can rotate that face, and notice how the thickness, thickness faces of the adjacent flanges also rotate as well and keep that closed up for me. So with live rules, maintaining that design intent in my steering wheel, it's very easy to get those changes. A couple other things. You see a small interference up here. Maybe I want to uh, quickly draw a construction circle. And one thing you'll notice here, I drew this off on, off on purpose, off of center. And what I can do is I can use some tools to go ahead and, um, go ahead and snap the center point back to there and now notice how that's on center. Maybe I want to create a dimple, a deformation feature there in the sheet metal part. So I've created a dimple. Let me go ahead and hide the previous level again and maybe to finish this model off we want to go ahead and round some corners or break those corners. We don't want anybody getting cut on those. So I'm just window selecting those corners and maybe I'll add a round of, of 10 degrees. Notice how now nobody's going to get cut on those sharp corners. And finally, the thing that <coughs> is very important to sheet metal is to be able to create a flat pattern. At. So just by going into flat pattern environment with two clicks, it's going to give me what the flat pattern of that is. And notice it's also giving me what raw sheet size that would take to be able to make that part. So just with two clicks, you get that feedback. The other tool before I get out of here is also a bend table. There's a bend table associated with this, and I'm going to show you a little bit later how we can call this out on the drawing. But you see the bend table, notice how it's ballooning each of those bends. And based on what we create, what we define as a flat pattern, it's saying that this bend is bent 90 degrees down with that, that much of an angle. And notice how as I highlight my cursor across each of those items, it's showing me the bends uh, graphically on the 3D model. And like I said, a little bit later I will show you how to put that on the drawing. So there we gave you an introduction to uh, the sheet metal environment. Going back up here. Um, I also want to do a comparison for you. Let me turn on all the parts. I just have a configuration that allows me to turn on the parts very quickly. And what we're going to look at here is doing a comparison. So what we want to do is a comparison between um, an ordered edit 
and a um, synchronous set it. So what I have here, I just have a quick ABI of, of doing some things here in order. I'm going to let that update on your screen. And what we're looking at doing, this is the gas tank uh, for the, uh, the lawnmower here. And here's some engineering change orders that need to be done. So we need to move this face down uh, three quarters of an inch or so. We need to increase this angle by 10 degrees. Then there's two pockets over here. The pocket needs to move down an inch and a half uh, below the top surface. And then the other, the other one needs to uh, match that depth. So those pockets need to match them. So what you're looking at here is um, the sheet metal in an ordered or traditional environment. So you have a linear history tree over here to the left. And what you're going to do is have to find those features and edit those sketch. This is the traditional modeling that we were talking about that's been technology for a long time. So here we're going to make a change to the sketch, increase that sketch to 175. And then you'll notice how the bottom of the history tree where it says cons uh, console cut out, everything's rolled back. So what that means, it's making that change and then it has to recalculate all the parent-child relationships and everything below that linear history tree. Here you need to find the feature here as well. You gotta go find the feature that was created in this particular cutout. And as we were asking the questions, is your, is your system really 3D? Why do I have to go back to the sketch? Here I'm going back to the sketch as well and making a change to that, moving that down. And notice once again, depending on where that change happens in the history tree, it has to regenerate everything below there. You see how those little rollback symbols and how everything below frame clearance was recalculated. Here we also need to find the feature, and you've got to be careful when using features because you might accidentally grab a draft feature. Here you had to find the cutout. And what you want to do is go back and you're going to edit the feature. In this case, it's editing the 3D extent inside the feature, but you have to go back to the feature, and once again, you see how it's recalculating everything that happened below hanger clearance. So there's some time, regeneration time to make that change. <coughs> Excuse me. Lastly, you need to increase the angle. So that angle is actually stored in the base feature. You have to kind of, and you know, if it's somebody else's model, you have to go in there and, and determine that, yeah, this is the base feature, this is where that angle is. But once again, we're going back to the sketch, making that change, and you see how that was the first feature in the history. So everything below it in that linear history tree has to recalculate. So there's going to be some regeneration time. Also, whenever you get into a more complex model, for those of you that are using a traditional CAD system, notice how that opening in the cutout, it didn't quite rotate that face the way we wanted. And then there's some failed features that we would now have to go back in and fix, depending if the extent was changed or if material was, was not added or if it needed to be removed and, and so forth. But you see that there was, were some failed features. So let's, let's make the same change here with synchronous technology. I'm just going to open up this particular uh, gas tank. I'm just going to go ahead and open that up inside a solid edge. And what you're going to notice is synchronous technology, I can just select those faces just as you've been seeing, and I don't have to worry about where that feature was in the history tree. If I need to make that change, I'm just going to say move it down, and it's going to do a, what we call a synchronous salt, a dynamic edit. It didn't roll back any history tree with synchronous technology. This is not a linear history tree. This is a collection of faces. Also, I said that the engineering change order this had to be so far below the face. Well, with synchronous technology, I can come in there and, and place a 3D drive dimension between what faces I want, and I don't need to make that an inch and three quarters. It's going to dynamically move that. I didn't have to go back and in, interrogate where that happened in the tr history tree. If I come back, I need to relate that and make that coincident to that face. See, with two clicks, we have now uh, made those faces match up. And finally, if I need to rotate this face, I don't need to know that that happened in the first feature. I'm just going to use my steering wheel and directly interact with that model and rotate that face. Notice how just by selecting that face, those adjacent rounds also maintain the design intent and come along for the ride. So I've rotated that face. I actually rotated that. It was supposed to be 10, but I did 20. Let's, let's go back 10 the other way. And I've made that change. And only what I, I changed moved. <clears throat> Therefore, I got the desired result I wanted. So just a little comparison between um, what a traditional change would take and then what we do here with synchronous technology. <clears throat> the other thing is, is we want to talk about other foreign forms of data, whether it's neutral data uh, as a step file, a pair solid, or whether it's uh, competitive data like a SolidWorks file, a Pro-E file, and so forth. 
Let's go ahead and take a look at some assembly tools and then I want to bring up a model uh, here in a minute that, that shows, um, shows some changes there. The first thing we want to look at, as you see here with this particular sub-assembly, right now this is this lawnmower is set up to be mechanical, uh, raise and lower the deck. So you have a lever that you, you know, most people, most of us have a lever to bring and raise and lower your deck is what I'm trying to say. Uh, maybe we want to add, you know, maybe we want a high-end mower, just for example, and we want to make it and put electric motor or whatever the case may be. So here you see that I'm bringing in a, a file. This is a file, maybe it's a, a, a part that was downloaded from a catalog, maybe it's a supplier part, but this is inventor data. It's now inside a solid edge. And just to quickly constrain those parts, what we're going to do is just locate this motor, and I'm just using my assembly constraints. And you see that I'm just mating faces and make, creating axial uh, relationships and so forth. Now I'm going to leave the third relationship off because I want the degree of freedom to move that. The other part we want to drag in is this flange that's going to mount to that, that sheet metal part and that's actually what's going to couple uh, the motor and this, this, this uh, part together, if you will. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and constrain that. Just by picking faces, it knows it needs to mate. If I pick uh, cylindrical geometry, still on the cylinder, it knows I need to align, uh, do a, a axial line, and same thing there. I'm just kicking, clicking the geometry, and it's it's aligning those up in the assembly. The other thing that's cool with synchronous technology is I've left my degree of freedom. I can also pick that part and do a move with my steering wheel. So notice how I'm moving that entire part. I'm moving it closer to the green part that came from SolidWorks. Now, if you take a look at this, if I rotate this around, you see the shape of the green part. It doesn't have any mounting holes, and it's just a circular shape. If I rotate around and look at the flange that is on the motor from Inventor, you see that it's more of a star shape, and there's some mounting holes there. So right now, that's not going to fly. Right? We cannot just mate that up. So what we want to do is go in and use our synchronous technology tools to copy that geometry over and use it inside of our, our 3D model. So what I'm going to do is just come in here and like I said I'm going to copy, maybe I want to copy this information from the inventor geometry and right now I have that as a construction. I'm going to hide the previous level, turn off the background components so you can see exactly what I'm doing. And what I want to do is I want to move this geometry. Right now I have this face set and just by locating my steering wheel I can say move this geometry back to this face and I can attach it. So what I did there was I took Inventor that come in from in Inventor, took data that come in from Inventor and then I've pasted it and included it or attached it if you will to data that come in with SolidWorks all within Solid Edge. If I turn back on the background components you see we have the right shape but it doesn't go up there and match that. So what I want to do is select the faces I want to move and I can move those faces up so they, they mate to the motor. So now I've created my, my flange. Right? So the point is whether it came, whether it's native to Solid Edge, whether it came from SolidWorks, whether it came to Inventor, all of our synchronous tools, our 3D driving dimensions, our, our steering wheel, all those tools apply whether it's native data or not. Finally what we want to do is we can create some inner part relationships saying that I want this part this inventor part to drive my green SolidWorks part, or data that comes from SolidWorks, I should say. So as I go across here, what this is doing is asking me what kind of relationships do you want to find. Right now it's seeing that these holes are lined up, that these faces are coplanar, and I want to save those relationships into the green part. Notice the, the purple construction now. I also want to save the location of it and have it drive from the sheet metal part that the flange is mounted to. And maybe I'm only concerned about the hole locations between these counterboard holes and where they mount to the, the sheet metal bracket behind it. So I'm just going to go ahead and store that information. And you see there I have a little purple uh, construction showing me that those inner part links were stored in synchronous technology. <coughs> so now I'm back at my top level assembly and let's let top level assembly and let's see what these these, these inner part links are doing for us. If I come in here and I want to make a change to this bracket, I'm just going to move this up. And notice I am at the assembly level. 
And if I move over here so I don't snap to a key point there, move that up. Maybe I want to move that up seven millimeters. Notice how the green part is going to jump out in an update because of those inner part lengths. If I come around to this side and I make a change to the inventor motor, inventor motor, I'm starting to not be able to tank. <laughs> tank. <laughs> starting to not be able to talk. Bear with me here. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> if I select that face and I want to move that up and make that change, notice I move that up maybe six millimeters, that star shape. Once again, live rules are maintaining that. And also notice how the green part, that data that came from SolidWorks, also updated. So once again, the point there is, you know, no matter where the data come from, we can use synchronous technology to make those changes and maintain that design intent. And I, I notice I'm being uh, long-winded here. I got I got a couple more things I want to show you. Bear with me here. I've got ten minutes. I might run over just a little bit. The next thing I want to talk about is what file formats we can open, and I want to show you bringing in an an AutoCAD file. So I'm just going to go ahead and open and just briefly here, you notice if you glance at this, I'm just going to point out some of the highlights. We have our native formats. We can open NX documents, uh, .prts. We can open uh, the ACES kernel documents from uh, Inventor. We can open DWGs, DXFs from AutoCAD. We can open ProE parts and assemblies, SolidWorks parts and assemblies, step documents, Parasolid, IGES, you know, those formats you, you'd expect. What we want to look at here is actually bringing in an AutoCAD file. And quickly to run through the wizard, if I run through this wizard, this is how we're going to bring in the AutoCAD file. Notice I can preview the file. <coughs> this is a hub that goes on the end of one of those transaxles in the lawnmower. Notice the layer structure coming across. As I step through each page of this wizard, I can say what units, you know, am I going to open this to a company template, a, a drawing template? If I go on to the next page, what sheet size do I want to bring it into? If there's 2D model space inside of AutoCAD, how do I want to bring that in? Do I want to scale it as a best fit? Also, here is, is the line types, so what the AutoCAD line type is and what it's going to be inside of Solid Edge. If there's a couple of them I don't like, you notice that I can come in here and change these and map these different ways. Same thing with the AutoCAD colors. I'll show you what the line width is going to be. I can come in there and change those if there's something I don't quite like. Also, the fonts, how the fonts are going to map from AutoCAD to Solid Edge, and also the hatching. And once you've filled this out, and, and, and you know, maybe you've made some tweaks. Most people use it out of the box, but maybe you've made some tweaks there. You can create this as a configuration file, and you don't have to come back in here again. So notice this is going to open this up into my template. <coughs> and this was a 2D DWG file from AutoCAD. Once again, notice the layer structure. I can manipulate the layers. I could save this back to AutoCAD, either DWG, DXF. But what I want to do is I want to create a model of this. This is what I'm most interested in. So notice I can come over here and I can manipulate these, these layers. I can hide and show layers. Notice now we have the actual object geometry and also the, the dimensions, the manufacturing dimensions that were uh, developed or, or designed inside of AutoCAD. I'm going to come through and I'm just going to say what environment I want this to come open in Solid Edge. And I'm just going to window select my views. Notice how the dimensions are also selecting. And I want this to be a right side view and notice how the dimensions are selecting. And one thing that's cool is I can also set what we call a full line, which will create my symmetry. And what that means is you see how it opened up the part model and it folded up that construction geometry. And now it put that right side view right on the center, so to speak. Right? Now with synchronous technology and the region concept, I can come in here and pick these regions and just in a matter of minutes I can have my model created. The other thing, before I finish off the model, notice the brown dimensions. Those are detached dimensions. But notice as I create the 3D model, notice how those snap right to the 3D model and they become blue driving PMI dimensions. So what that's showing you is that these dimensions are attached to the 3D model. If I needed to make changes, I could go ahead and say, you know, I want that to be locked down to 30 millimeters. If I change the overall height of that, and once again, this is a 3D driving dimension, we're not doing anything with the 2D sketch, I can drive that. Notice how that other face is coming 30 millimeters behind it. I want that to make 50. Just a couple other things. These are the PMI driving dimensions we've been talking about. 
just making some changes there. What if I want to change the, the pattern of this, this hole? Maybe I want to make a change. Notice how live rules is maintaining the tangencies in the, the, um, the tangencies and how those faces and whether they're symmetric and so forth. The other thing I can do if I want that to move in a specific vector, if I go ahead and say I want that to be a vector to the center point, notice how now as I move those holes out, those ears out, that they are maintaining a, a, a that particular vector and it's it's that direction. I move those out 12 millimeters. Just a couple things to uh, finish up here. Maybe I want to increase this round. Notice how the live rules are moving the rounds all the way across the model. So if I want that to be 46. And also we talked about parametrics, but we do have, you know, kind of talked about parametrics in the 80s and the traditional CAD system, but we do have parametrics involved with synchronous technology. You see the, the 3D drive dimensions being true parametric dimensions. And what we can do here, you see we have a 63, in this case a 43, diam uh, 43 millimeter diameter cylindrical face there, and we have a 63 millimeter um, cylindrical face there. And I can also create a relationship, or in this case a formula between those, and maybe I always want that face to be 20 millimeters behind that. So if I drive the 63 uh, millimeter dimension, notice how the other one is staying 20 millimeters behind it. If I type in 70 here, notice how the other uh, face will be 50. So we can add uh, formulas to these 3D driving dimensions as well. All right, to wrap up here, I want to create a drawing and uh, maybe we want to document and create some uh, drawings of our, our 3D models, assemblies, and so forth. So I want to give you a, an overview of the uh, drawing environment. Here, this could be a company template. This is a template that set up. You know, we can have it uh, call out properties down here in the title block. But what we want to do is look at uh, creating views of, of the model that we created earlier, the part that holds the, the transaxles and, and the mower. I'm going to run through the drawing view wizard and you're going to notice that we can just say what file it is and this is the wizard step by step. How are you going to bring this in? If you notice as we go through the wizard, I can place up to nine views at one time. In this case, I'm going to do the most, you know, your typical front, top, ISO, and right. And as soon as I click finish, those are attached to my cursor. I can come up here in my ribbon bar and, and change the scale. Let's go ahead and make this a little larger and I just click to place those views. Maybe I want this to be a shaded view. Some of the guys on the shop floor like those. It gives you a little more depth. Also, as I move the top view, notice how, see if this updates over the top of the web, notice how the other views, the, in this case the front, is maintaining alignment. I remember back from college, my engineering graphics class, where we had to draw those and maintain that alignment. Solid Edge uh, uh, does that by default for us. So if you'll remember the, the manufacturing or the PMI dimensions that we placed on the model, what we can do here on the drawing is we can use a tool called Retrieve Dimensions. And notice how that, just by clicking the view, it will retrieve both the dimensions and also those annotations we placed. So there's my GD and T annotation, my weld symbol, and my uh, datum frame. At this point, we are in draft. I could come in here and place even more dimensions. It retrieves what we have, but I can obviously detail anything we have here just by selecting multiple things. I'm calling off any information. Also, with the same smart dimension tool I'm using right now, just by hitting A on the keyboard, that'll go ahead and place an angle view, or I'm sorry, an angle dimension. Moving on here, the other thing we have is something called a quick sheet template. So you see that this template has uh, some saved type views that this is a one to two scale each of these views and what I can do is I can go to a part from my library and drag it out and notice how it populates those views that were predetermined. Also it was set to go ahead and retrieve these dimensions. So a lot of times you have a lot of drawings that are the same, you know, same format, the same type of views over and over again. You can use that template and just drag and, and very quickly uh, detail some parts and place those views. A couple other things here, if I, I go ahead and place a view here, maybe I want to create a, a section view. I'm just going to come in and grab my section view and create a section view of this cutting plane. You see there's my section view as I zoom up on that. Also, if I want to place a couple of dimensions, once again, I can dimension uh, anything on here. Actually, I'm going to show you this midpoint here. So that's 16 millimeters. Maybe I want to place some dimensions here. 
anything. I, I can dimension anything I want to uh, select on this particular 2D drawing. What if I want to make a change? It's very easy to make a change inside of the Solid Edge. I just double click on the view. Notice how it launches the model. It's going to go right to the model. And in this case, I have what's called a live section in synchronous technology. So you see the live section on the end. I can come in there and place a 3D PMI dimension just to kind of match what you saw on the drawing. And that is a driving PMI dimension. So from 16, I'm going to make that 18. And then what's going to happen whenever I switch back to the drawing, it's going to show me that that view's out of date. I just update that view. And this tool here, Dimension Tracker, is a very nice tool. What I can do is, what's changed, I can come in there and say find. Notice how it zooms right up on the dimension. It says it was 16, now it's 18. And what sheet I'm working on, which I'm on the CAS Quick Sheet. And what it's going to do is give me feedback so I can double check and see what's, what's been changed. And I can clear those uh, as I've checked those off. So you see that it's very easy to go back to the model, make a change, and then get feedback of what's changed. As far as creating other drawing sheets, it's very easy. It's just like Excel. If I want to right click, I can say insert, insert a new sheet. If I go back and maybe I want to, uh, let's put the sheet metal part that we created earlier. Go ahead and, and create that sheet metal part. Um, first, I'm going to place the, uh, an ISO view. Once again, maybe we want some depth perception, put that on the drawing, um, and, and a shaded view for the guys out on the shop floor. Let's go back to the wizard, but what we're really concerned about is getting that flat pattern. So I'm just going to say I want to pick the flat pattern. And there's my flat pattern. Notice how it automatically puts our bend center lines in us in the drawing. If I come up and remember the bend table I showed you in the 3D, if I come up and select bend table, notice how I can place that bend table. Notice how it numbers the sequence of the bends, and that matches our bend table. So that's the same exact bend table we saw in the 3D model. So it's very easy just to call that out. Finally, maybe we want to create another sheet and create an exploded view, maybe of a, a sub-assembly that we're going to have in here. And I can do it through the drawing wizard, but I can also drag it right here from my parts library. If I come in here, I can maybe pick an exploded view, which we've set up. And maybe we want it shaded, maybe we don't. I'm, I'm going to put it shaded. But notice here we have our exploded view of, of one of the blade assemblies underneath in the deck. And if we want to create a parts list, we can have save parts list. And what this is going to do is I can come in here and have, like I said, a save parts list that I have. I have multiple saved in my template. And what it's going to do is it's going to automatically balloon that sub-assembly for us and then create our parts list. This particular parts list which I created is calling out the item number which you see here based on the balloons, uh, the file name of the, the part, and it knows the quantity because how many occurrences they are in that particular assembly. If I go back and look at the options here quickly, you see that these are all the available properties that can be populated and all that can be extracted right to your bill of material, whether it's um, an author, a file name, a material, for sheet metal, material thickness, miters, um, and so forth. There's a lot of file properties which you can um, call out in, in that information. And like I said, it automatically balloons it and keeps it nice and neat. We didn't have to go through and manually type that up. Uh, just to wrap up here, uh, a couple things, and then we're going to open it up to questions. I'm sorry I'm running over a few minutes. Bear with me. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is as far as learning Solid Edge, uh, there are Solid Edge tutorials. If you look at the tutorials, I can come through it, group some. Here's part tutorials, assembly tutorials. It tells you how much time is expected to complete each one of those. It's very nice, uh, a way to start learning right out of the box. If I go to introduction about uh, synchronous uh, tutorial, it's going to open up me, the, the part file I need to use, and then it's going to open up the tutorial window on the right. So on the right, it's telling me what to do. I'm going to go through and, and just read about it. It's telling me to draw a rectangle, rectangle by center. It's going to show me how to put dimensions on there. And what that allows me to do is be able to work on the left. So if I come in here and do the same thing as a tutorial, I can come in here and say I'm going to create a rectangle. I'm going to place uh, dimensions. I'll put it on the other side, but there's 160. You get the idea there. And that one's 90 or something like that. But you get the idea of, of how, how we're going to follow along with the tutorials. And those are right out of the box. 
that is one way. And obviously, whenever you you get you buy you purchase Solid Edge, you get help from us. What, what we're going to wrap up here with is is talk about Alpha. Ally PLM and, and where we come into play and what, what value you get from us. We have full training classes, uh, Siemens developed classes, we develop our own classes, we have some custom classes you know, to kind of fit, fit a particular customer's needs. We can come work in you uh, in a consulting environment as well. Uh, customer support, we are frontline support, we're local, we know your business needs. There's also GTAC, so with Solid Edge you actually get dual support. Um, you get us locally, uh, your frontline support, and you also get a 1-800 number at GTAC where um, from 8 to 8, they're there within 90 seconds, they're on the phone to answer your questions. We also have local user events, uh, both web and live. Uh, one of the things we've been doing, you see there's a call to lunch bite sessions, and what we've been doing is every two weeks we have a topic, maybe kind of a tips and tricks or talk about a particular topic and do a 30-minute session that's over the web so that you can sit at your desk and, um, and learn something about Solid Edge without having to drive or take all day to get there and so forth. We also do uh, new product launches, so each time a new release is um, out, we do a product launch to teach you about the new release. And also we have uh, monthly newsletters that have information, tips and tricks and information on, on all these events. So we're, we're there to, to obviously support you and, and make sure you're successful and um, help out with, with uh, learning software.